Welcome everyone to the second presentation of the Fishtails Lecture Series. I am Mark Coley, the program organizers. For those participating via Zoom, please review the housekeeping details on the screen during this introduction. I want to remind you all of the two remaining lectures for this season. On Wednesday, April 12th, Dr. Dan Zielinski from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission will present on their latest initiative to uh, achieve continuous fish passage over existing barriers to Lake Michigan tributaries while preventing further expansion of invasive species. Dr. Zielinski will explain how combining engineering and fish behavior will accomplish those goals. Well, uh, and then uh, w, uh, Wisconsin DNR veterinarian Nicole uh, Niedlischbach will speak at our last presentation on Thursday, April 27th, about the impact of the largemouth bass virus that was recently detected in our smallmouth bass in Green Bay, what the current knowledge is, and what further questions remain uh, about its impact on the fisheries. Fishtail's presentations will be recorded and available at youtube.com. And all you need to do is get on youtube.com and then search for Fishtails Lecture Series Dash Door County Library and they will all pop up. So that's a way to access them. And usually they're available about a week or so after each presentation. So you also will be able to access the last two years as well. Tonight, we're very honored to have Dr. Val Klump to present uh, us, to us on the future of meeting the challenges of restoring and preserving our Great Lakes. Previous Fishtails lectures has focused primarily on the science of Great Lakes fisheries, but we cannot adequately manage or restore fishery populations without first restoring and maintaining adequate water quality. Uh, Dr. Klump has a bachelor's degree for in zoology from the Duke University, a law degree from Georgetown University, and a PhD in marine sciences from the University of North Carolina at Chapel, Chapel Hill. Val began his career at UW-Milwaukee in 1980 and is a former dean and professor of the School of Freshwater Sciences. His groundbreaking research has focused why isn't this moving? There we go. Uh, where was I? His groundbreaking research has focused on how nutrients and carbon are cycled in large freshwater lakes. And that includes the, uh, the identifying and monitoring a hypoxic or dead zone that develops in Southern Green Bay. Uh -huh. Dr. Klump was also a key organizer for a special section of 17 scientific papers on the Green Bay ecosystem in the October 2019 issue of the International Journal of Great Lakes Research. He was the senior author of the lead paper that made the case that throughout the entire Great Lakes Basin, Green Bay was the proving ground for Great Lakes restoration. Restoration and preservation of the Great Lakes water began in earnest with the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972 and the Great Lakes uh, Water Quality Agreement between the US and Canada in 1978. Tonight, we will be enlightened on the progress for restoration and the future of the Great Lakes water. Please give a warm, work, warm, a warm welcome to Dr. Klump. Thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to come and speak this evening. And what a beautiful place this is. I think this is my second time, only my second time here, and uh, uh, I really appreciate it. So without any further ado, um, <clears throat> I'm going to, you know, as Mark said, I'm not a fish guy, although I'll try to talk a little bit about fish, but more about, you know, what the future of the Great Lakes and what are the challenges we face uh, currently in the Great Lakes ecosystem. Um, of course, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Great Lakes are, you know, 20% of the world's surface freshwater. Without question, this is the single greatest freshwater resource on, on the face of the planet. Um, but of course, it's not just, uh, it's heavily impacted by humans. Um, about 10% of the U.S. population uh, lives in the Great Lakes Basin, about 30% of the Canadian population. And as a result, uh, we have a big impact on these lakes. And this is a map showing the various stresses 
Uh, and this map was put together with, I think, 34 different stresses where red is the most stressed area. And you can see two things, I think, out of this. One is the nearshore areas are typically the ones that are most highly stressed and downstream in the Great Lakes, Lakes Erie and Ontario are the most heavily stressed ecosystem. I mean, some of you probably recognize this photograph actually made the cover of Time Magazine. Um, and uh, this is 1969, it was the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, which caught on fire. It wasn't the only time the Cuyahoga River caught on fire and it wasn't the only river in the Great Lakes that caught on fire. And this uh, image was attributed in part to spurring the passage, as Mark said, of the Clean Water Act 50 years ago. And as a result of the Clean Water Act, we've done a really remarkable job in, in cleaning up the Great Lakes and a lot to be a lot to be grateful for, but we still have, as you'll see, some challenges ahead of us. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that they did was to control what's known as point source discharge. That's coming out of municipal sewage treatment plants, industrial discharges, et cetera. And the target then for phosphorus, which is a principal eutrophying nutrient in the Great Lakes, was a 60% reduction, which was a significant reduction. But within 10 years, they actually uh, made it. Of course, at the time, Lake Erie was declared dead. It was considered a loss. I went like the 10th or 11th largest lake in the world declared dead. <clears throat> but then what happens, I call the Seuss effect. Uh, and of course, I'm sure you, if you have grandchildren, I'm sure you're familiar with the Dr. Seuss's book, The Lorax, which talks about fish and says they'll walk on their fins and grow woefully weary and so search of some water, which isn't so dreary. I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. So people in Lake Erie got upset because water quality had improved dramatically. And so they petitioned Dr. Seuss to remove that line. And if you go to the library today and you pick up a copy of the Lorax, you will not see, unless it's a very old copy, which is hard to imagine, uh, that line no longer appears. On the other hand, we still have major problems. This is a satellite image, obviously, of, of Lake Erie. Um, you see a massive cyanobacterial bloom in the western basin of Lake Erie. <clears throat> Here's another uh, aerial image, and that little round dot there is a 100-foot laker. And you can see the wake of this through this cyanobacterial bloom. And this is a toxic algae, produces a toxin, um, a neurotoxin, which is extremely toxic. And uh, in 2014, water intake at the city of Toledo, they detected this toxin and ended up shutting down the water intake for three days. And 500,000 people without drinking water. You couldn't wash your hands with it, you couldn't give it to your pets. The zoo had to find a new source of water. Hospitals couldn't use it to sterilize their instruments. It was truly a major disaster um, and a Cuyahoga moment. And so we still have major challenges. And the, the real challenge there is non-point source discharges. And what we have is a similar situation, although a lower scale, here in Green Bay. Um, and Green Bay is unique in that uh, it's relatively small, only 7% of the surface area and less than 2% of the volume of Lake Michigan. And yet it receives about a third of the total phosphorus load to the entire basin. <clears throat> and as a consequence, we have eutrophic, you know, algal blooms, uh, excessive algal blooms in, in Green Bay as well. And one of the things that has led to is the formation of these Green Bay dead zones, which you probably have heard about because it's been in, mentioned in the press quite a bit. These dead zones trigger a number of other problems. They're triggered initially by excessive nutrient loads and algal production. When an algae sinks to the bottom, it begins to decompose. It takes up the oxygen. And Green Bay is a very efficient particle trap, about 70%, at least 70% of the material which comes into the bay actually stays in the bay. And the Green Bay dead zone is a summertime phenomenon as a result of stratification. I'll mention that in, in a little bit <clears throat> right here. What happens in the summer is when the surface water warms up, warm water is less dense than cold water. And so you get known as a stratified condition where you have this warm surface water over a cool bottom water. Basically, that seals that bottom water off from the atmosphere, so it can no longer take up oxygen from the atmosphere. So the amount of oxygen present in that bottom water has to last all summer long, or at least until the, the lake is re, remixed in the fall. <clears throat> Green Bay is interesting. It's sometimes referred to as the largest freshwater estuary in the world, and it has a unique kind of circulation. 
in that you had the Fox River flowing in in the south. It's warm surface, it's warm river water, which is highly nutrient enriched. And then you on the bottom, you have uh, cool um, hyper or mesoeutrophic or oligotrophic water, nutrient poor water coming in from Lake Michigan. Um, and it's highly weather dependent and wind dependent. When you get these southwest winds, it'll push the water out. And as a result, there's a counter current exchange of water to make up that displacement as comes in from the bottom. And as, as that water comes from the north, this cool bottom water, and slowly, the oxygen is slowly taken up. So that by the time it gets into the southern portion of the bay, it's already heavily depleted. And then the last you know, few kilometers can actually deplete the oxygen to, in some cases, zero. Here's just a plot of, of the, uh, uh, the length of the hypoxic period um, over the last uh, 20 years or so, or 30 years, actually. On this way, this data is collected by uh, New Water, the, the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewage District, and had a sensor near the entrance light to the harbor uh, over this time period. It was originally started by John Kennedy, and uh, it measures the oxygen in the bottom water. That's a relatively shallow uh, station, only seven meters deep, so it can be mixed fairly quickly. So it's an indication, however, I think of the ox conditions further north in the bay. And as you can see, it looks as if there has been an increase in hypoxia over the last um, 10 to 15 years. <clears throat> Typically, the period during which hypoxia can occur lasts around, on average, about 70 days. And that is from the time you first observe it to the time you last observe it in the fall. Uh, although there have been years when it's been almost up to 100 days, for example, in, in 2005. So the major driver of this is the nutrient input to the system. It stimulates algal production. Uh, and we also see these cyanobacterial blooms that, that are that are common in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. And in fact, it's many parts of the Great Lakes now, including even the near shore of, uh, of Lake Superior in the last 10 years. So where is this phosphorus coming from? This is a plot uh, from Dale Robertson, USGS. Uh, provided me this a, a couple of weeks ago. And basically um, the point sources, that is the stuff that's coming out of uh, municipal treatment plants or in industrial discharges are shown here in the small bars at the bottom. The remainder shown in pink there is the non-point source. That's the stuff that runs off city streets or farm fields, et cetera. In order to improve water quality in the Bay, it's estimated we need to reduce the phosphorus flux coming into the system by 40%. That's a big, that's a big decrease. Uh, the TMDL target is about a 40% reduction. <clears throat> so the question is, and of course, this has uh, gotten a significant amount of press, not much of it good. Uh, this is by Dan Egan, whom I'm sure you are familiar with. And the long-term projection our current timeline for the implementation of phosphorus reduction in Green Bay. This is over the next 30 years. Uh, and this is a timeline from the, published by the DNR. If you look at the, what's targeted for the biggest reduction in this system is agriculture. In fact, it is by 2050, there's an 82% reduction in the amount of, of, of runoff from agriculture. <clears throat> that's gonna be a tough, I think that's gonna be difficult. So where does the non-point source load come from? Well, obviously it's not distributed, you know, uniformly across the watershed, but there are certain portions of the watershed in which we see uh, significant phosphorus yields and sort of these sort of hotspots. And this is work done by Paul Baumgart and uh, Kevin Fermanich at UW Green Bay. And so the question then is, is where in this landscape can we find a 40% reduction? And it really, to the most bang for the buck, would be to target those areas which have the highest, the highest loading or the highest yields. And so what Kevin and Paul did is they said, well, what kind of management practices could we put in place today that would actually get the kind of reduction we think we need? Um, and relative to a baseline, which they projected about, you know, 90% conventional till for agriculture, they said, well, if we were to convert that 90% down to 10% conventional till, 50% uh, reduced tillage and 40% no-till, you gain about 11% reduction in the phosphorus load. 
If you added cover crops on that, the estimate would go up to maybe 18%. It was only went to the point where you can actually reduce soil test phosphorus to 1970 levels. In other words, the amount of phosphorus, it's actually, there's a huge legacy in soils. Reduce that legacy to the point where the only phosphorus you put on the field is, is sufficient to, to cover the crops, to, to grow the crops you have. At that point, you do begin to see reductions uh, of the order of magnitude that we're looking for. How will the bay respond? Um, we have a very sort of complex uh, ecosystem model, which couples the hydrodynamics of biogeochemistry and the loading to the system. Well, this was work done by uh, scientists at UW Milwaukee and also Limnotech and, and UWGB. And basically, the model says that for, uh, say, a 50% reduction in the load, we would see about a 30% reduction in the chlorophyll load, the algal biomass in the bay. So that the, the bay is pretty responsive to reductions in, in chlorophyll, you know, and the reductions in nutrient loading. And my feeling is that that response would be relatively quick as well. And so that's that's good news if we can uh, we can obtain this. And there are some encouraging signs here in Wisconsin. I think we have a long way to go, but I do think that uh, there are, there are some good actors out there who are attempting to do their best. <clears throat> what about other uh, pollution threats? Um, for example, spills, which has made the press, and things like emerging contaminants, things like pharmaceuticals, nanomaterials, pesticides, PFAS, which of course been in the news a lot. Uh, microplastics, personal care products, uh, basically, you name it. Um, <clears throat> with respect to spills, this was a series also done by Dan, I draw a lot on Dan, um, about the pipeline, as you probably know, which crosses the Straits of Mackinac, Line 5, uh, owned and operated by Enbridge. Um, and I just learned today that that, line, that pipeline earns between $1.6 and $2 million a day, so it's a very lucrative uh, uh, enterprise. You can see here is it's shown <clears throat> where it crosses the Straits of Mackinac. Of course, we send oil and petroleum products all over the country to pipelines, and generally this is one of the safest ways to do that. <clears throat> so the question is, this pipeline is, is uh, probably close to 70 years old now, and, and there's concern that you know, if, if it were to ever break, what would the consequences be? And this was some modeling done uh, several years ago, actually, by scientists at the NOAA lab in Ann Arbor. Uh, and you can see the clock running down there. It says there's three days after release. The problem is this is one of the most highly dynamic areas in the Great Lakes. Uh, the water between Michigan and Huron sloshes back and forth at you know, pretty high velocity. And you can say even after a week that the oil that would be spilled uh, would spread dramatically, you know, very extensively. And my feeling is you could never clean this up. And the other thing, too, is unlike the horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, this is fresh water. It's also very cold. You couldn't use, because it's fresh water and we drink it, you couldn't use the same dispersants that they used, say, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico. I think this would be a disaster from which probably it would safe to say there'd be no complete recovery. And that's why people, I think, are, are concerned. <clears throat> uh, what's the risk? Well, the risk is probably very small. On the other hand, the, uh, uh, or the probability is small, but the risk is very high. There's actually a new uh, Coast Guard Center, uh, which studies the impact of oil spills in freshwater, which just started and it's housed at uh, Lake Superior State in Sault Ste. Marie. There is an example. Uh, there was a, a, a pipeline break on the Kalamazoo River, um, owned by the same company, uh, in 2010. And I can remember it pretty well because uh, it broke on a Friday and then Sunday evening, I got a phone call from a, a friend of mine who actually is the operator of the limbo filtration plant. He said, Val, he said, do I have to worry about this? Because, you know, this is going to come get into Lake Michigan. I said, no, EPA indicates that they have the oil spill contained and, and none of this oil actually ever made it to the Great Lakes, <clears throat> to Lake Michigan. Uh, on the other hand, it took over six years and over a billion dollars to clean up. And this was a relatively small or relatively confined, confined spill. Well, what about other threats that we're concerned about? Other portions of um, emerging contaminants? One, of course, is, is plastics. Here's a, here's a, 
a statistic for you, which is mind boggling. I, I found it really hard to believe, so I looked it up more than once. There are 20 million pounds of plastics enter the Great Lakes every year, 20 million pounds. It's hard to conceive, about half of that goes into Lake Michigan, 10 million pounds a year. So it's a major problem, I think, and one I don't know that we're doing much about. Uh, there are you know, technologies to help clean it up, but they're kind of small. You know, ultimately, the solution to this is we have to cut down the source. We really have to reduce material getting into the lake in the first place. I also notice there the number 2050. <clears throat> it's estimated uh, by oceanographers that by the year 2050, the biomass of plastics in the ocean will exceed the biomass of fish in the ocean. So this is a major problem. What about things like pharmaceuticals? Well, we all take them, at least I do. And, uh, uh, and because uh, we excrete them, they get into the sewage treatment system uh, and the same property, the same things that make them effective as medicines, that is they translate to our bodies without being altered, means they transfer through conventional sewage treatment uh, unaltered as well. And we can see um, <clears throat> practically the entire medicine chest uh, in Lake Michigan. Now they're, they're in very small concentrations and it's a testament to our analytical capability we can see them, but they are in, in fact there. One of the most common drugs that we see is metformin, which as you may know is a, a type two diabetes drug. It's estimated that from the South Shore sewage treatment plant, that's one of two sewage treatment plants in Milwaukee, discharges 6,400 kilograms of metformin a year. That's over 12,000 pounds of metformin from one sewage treatment plant going into Lake Michigan. Uh, this work is done by Rebecca Clapper, who is uh, the current dean of the School of Freshwater Sciences. One of her students was defending his thesis on this a few years ago. And I asked Ben, I said, Ben, what was the lowest concentration that you measured? Thinking that they'd say, well, you know, we got far enough offshore, it was undetectable. Uh, but that was not the case. He said, we never measured zero. Everywhere they went in Lake Michigan, they were able to, to measure metformin. It means two things. One, there's, a, there's an input to the system, obviously, a large one, but the material is not going away. It persists unchanged in the environment. Uh, <clears throat> and as a result, it's building up over time. Uh, now the question is, and the $64,000 question is, what impact is this having on the system? Well, Rebecca and her students have done some really cutting edge work on this. Uh, looking at the impact of uh, some of these pharmaceuticals and particularly metformin, they can see a feminizing effect on fish. Uh, male perch, for example, will develop egg-like material in their gonads when exposed to concentrations of metformin, which are equivalent to what you might find in the environment. I have another colleague who measured another radionuclide iodine-131, which is a radioactive pharmaceutical, it has an eight day half-life, which means every eight days half of it decays away. And he could see that in the system as far offshore as eight kilometers. And that means two things also, it means that it's constantly going in because it's constantly decaying away. So <clears throat> I think uh, understanding the impacts of these is gonna be a, a major challenge. Well, what about the other ecology? This one we're probably everybody's familiar with, and that is non-native species and invasive species in the Great Lakes. And of course, the sea lamprey and the yellow white spiny flea, there have been over 180 different species that are not native to the Great Lakes. Uh, we've done a reasonably good job in the last 10 years, actually, and have been almost none uh, new invasives as a result primarily of ballast water controls. Um, but of course, there's the Asian carp, which everyone is concerned about. It's not in the Great Lakes yet that we know of. Uh, my feeling is it will get there eventually. Um, <clears throat> and with the, with the Dreisaitic mussels, which is one that have come in most recently, have had a huge effect on the Great Lakes. Lake Michigan is an entirely different ecosystem than it was 20 years ago, or maybe even 10 years ago. They first, uh, zebra mussels first came into Lake Michigan in the, in the mid 1990s, and then the quagga mussels came in in the early 2000s and basically took over the entire ecosystem. So you're hard pressed to actually find a zebra mussel now in Lake Michigan. It's almost entirely quagga mussels, and you can see the distribution of quagga mussels 
um, <clears throat> in a matter of just a very few years. Of course, they're voracious, you know, filter feeders, and so they have a major impact on water quality. This video, which was taken early on in the zebra mussel, saying there are two things to look at that. One, how clear the water is. That's unusual for Lake Michigan. It looks like the Bahamas. And the fact that these rocks, this cobble field is entirely covered with these mussels. Um, water clarity has increased dramatically to the point where Lake Superior, which is one of the most pristine lakes in the world, is now the third clearest lake in Lake in the Great Lakes. Both the offshore waters of, of both Huron and Michigan have higher water clarity uh, than, than, Lake, than uh, Lake Superior. And here's a, a, a trawl that was taken uh, off of Milwaukee, 45 meters. Uh, and you can see the bag came up just full of, of uh, quagga mussels. And there was one fish. It's a round goby, which is also not native to the system. Um, and here's a, a video camera on that trawl. This is work done by Harvey Pruskin and his students. This is what the bottom of Lake Michigan now looks like. You can basically walk across the carpet of fog and mussels from one side to the other. Fog and mussels are different in that they, they can live on soft and muddy bottoms, whereas zebra mussels are really confined to hard substrates. It's had a huge impact on the fisheries biomass in the lake, and this was a data that goes up to 2018. Uh, this is USGS data. And you can see that the forage fish has dropped dramatically from probably its highs in the, in, in the late 80s and early 90s. That translates there to about 125 million pounds of, of, of forage base in the system. Um, and of course, uh, there have been press, Lake Michigan's lake fish populations are declining worse than projected, but that's not true in, in Green Bay. And one of the reasons is because Green Bay is a very productive system, but also uh, mussels don't have anywhere near the effect they have in, that they have in Lake Michigan because they're not nearly as abundant. Part of that is probably, probably frankly, due to the hypoxia that occurs that really wipes them out. Whenever we put a mooring in Green Bay, there's the top of the mooring will, you know, by the end of the season will be just clustered with small quagga mussels and zebra mussels. But below the thermocline, nothing. It's, it's clean as a whistle. It's because of periodically that low oxygen hits that mooring and they just can't tolerate it. Uh, the walleye fishery, however, in Green Bay has, you know, really done extremely well. Uh, perch is, is relatively low, uh, but the value of the fishery estimated to the local community, that's a walleye, is a predominant component of that is estimated to be at least $300 million a year from the, from the fishery alone. So it's really a phenomenal resource. <clears throat> and the near shore today in Lake Michigan, however, looks like this. Uh, you don't see any mussels there, but they are there. They're um, covered up by Clodophora, which is an attached algae, which actually lives on top of these um, mussels. And the reason it's done extremely well, it was the poster child actually for phosphorus removal back in the 70s, Clodophora. Uh, the reason it's done so well is because as, as, a, as the mussels uh, improve water clarity, light penetrates now much deeper than it did before. So a much broader extent of the nearshore environment is now illuminated with sunlight. Plus it needs sunlight, it needs something attached to, and it needs nutrients. And the mussels provide those nutrients by by squirting them out. <clears throat> so Clodophora, it's just huge meadows of Clodophora now. And then of course, when this organism senesces or dies or breaks off and washes up on beaches, it you know, begins to decay, sinks to high heavens, everybody thinks it's a sewage treatment plant, it's not the sewage treatment plant. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there are organisms that, that get trapped in here and uh, wildflower, um, um, uh, uh, birds and others uh, um, uh, feed in, in this zone. As it turns out, this decaying plant material is the ideal media for the organism which causes avian botulism. And so we had a huge resurgence of avian botulism in the Great Lakes. And it's not confined to just, you know, near cities. And I've seen it here in Door County, even. Um, <clears throat> and so 
ironically, the, the Great Lakes are going in two directions. We have like unprecedented nearshore harmful algal blooms and excessive uh, algal material and unprecedented offshore water clarity when it looks like the Bahamas. So what about climate change? Everybody is now, I think, becoming more and more aware of the potential impact of climate change. This is a plot of the average global temperature over the last, well, since over 140 years now. Um, I've been giving lectures on, on this for uh, probably 25 or 30 years, and every year I've said the same thing. The 10 hottest years have all been in the last 15. Well, in this case, the eight hottest years were the last eight years. 2022 was about the fifth warmest. The two warmest years were 2016 and 2019. Uh, <clears throat> One of the, this is an interesting paper I came across recently where a group of, of um, scientists modeled human climate niche. They said, well, what are the conditions which allow, you know, optimal, you know, living, in terms of uh, climate, in terms of agriculture, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and they showed this is most, you know, here's the most suitable zone in terms of temperature and precipitation. And they said, what's it gonna look like um, 40, 40 or 50 years down the road? And basically that line uh, produced pretty normal. Well, that's good for Wisconsin, right? I think in, in terms of, you know, we've, and, and more about that later, but <clears throat> in any case, this is a major, there's going to be a major shift and you're starting to see it now on the west coast with respect to wildfires and now torrential rains um, and I think that's going to have an impact on the demography of uh, the demographics of the Great Lakes region. People are going to start to look and say hmm that might not be such a bad place to live. In terms of our climate um, it's predicted to be both wetter and warmer um, by the middle toward the end of the century um, increase in, in daytime temperatures, uh, typically in the major increases at night and also uh, in the winter. In terms of wet uh, days, we're going to get more days where we get you know significant uh, rain events, and that certainly seems to be the case that we've already seen. 2019, you probably all remember that year, um, was the wettest year on record for our region right here. Uh, and not by just a little bit, it was 50% more precipitation almost than uh, we had previously on average, over, over four feet of, of, of rain of precipitation in 2019. And one of the consequences of the variability in, in, in weather and climate is the control that like controls um, lake levels. And two things control like those. One, the amount of evaporation that occurs. In other words, higher temperatures means more evaporation and the amount of precipitation. So it's a loss is evaporation in addition by precipitation. <clears throat> and one of the things that the climate scientists are now predicting is that, you know, we'll, we'll, we can, in long term, because of the variability in climate, we'll see higher highs and lower lows. And it certainly seems like the case so because the all time low was in December of 2013. We had a cold and wet period that um, skyrocketed. We came close here to an all time high, I didn't quite meet it. And today we're right here, I just looked up <clears throat> a couple of days ago, we're right back sort of to the long, long term average. But one of the impacts of these uh, extreme rainfall events is that most river systems are very event driven. And so the loading that comes off the landscape is very event driven. This is, of course, the mouth of, of Green Bay, the Fox River going into Green Bay. And this was work done by uh, Kevin. And where you can see that over 70% of the total phosphorus load and maybe almost as much as 90% of the total suspended sediment load occurs in those handful of days or two, 10 to 15 days in which it rains in the system. So any management practice which is going to curtail nutrient loading has got to address these extreme events, which we know are only going to get worse. <clears throat> so now back to the watershed. Um, Kevin and, and Paul asked the question, uh, what would it take, what would happen if we were to implement management practices today to get us that 40% reduction and climate change? And basically, regardless of the scenario you use under a sort of business as usual 
climate change model, and this is a suite of models that the phosphorus loading in all cases would actually go up. So the management practices we put in today uh, might give us a little bit of false sense of security of climate changes. And so we're gonna have to really keep an eye on what we're gonna do in the future. Um, and <clears throat> so existing management probably will not get us where we need to be. What about hypoxia? One of the projections for climate change is that the growing season is six weeks longer. And that means the stratified period, the summer is six weeks longer. So if you added on top of what we already see with respect to this dead zone formation, if you added another four weeks, say for example, of stratified conditions, how would you, how much worse would it get? And it, it, it would get considerably, it could be considerably worse. Um, <clears throat> and this is just a, this is sort of a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, if you add four more weeks, and the only time we've seen uh, a hypoxic season, it was 14 weeks long, was actually in 2005. And that was the one time we have actually seen a fish kill in Green Bay, uh, down near Dykesville, where tens of thousands of, of, of round gobies were driven up on the beach as a result of this blob of hypoxic water. <clears throat> gobies do not swim vertically, uh, so they stay along the bottom and it's just, just drove them out of the water. So the, someone has said that the major challenge we face in the 21st century is to, is to reconcile the inherent conflict between human activity and environmental sustainability. And I, and I think nowhere is that challenge greater than when it com comes to fresh water. Um, and that's one of the you know, major missions of the School of Freshwater Sciences. I give a little plug if you have grandchildren or, or kids that are interested in this field. Um, this is a great opportunity for them. This is the only School of Freshwater Sciences in the country here in the University of Wisconsin system. Uh, we just built a new facility, $50 million laboratory edition, which was opened in 2014. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we started off originally as a, as a graduate program uh, with uh, master's and PhD degrees. Um, Emily Tyner, just highlight her, she is actually the director of the NEARS program uh, at UW Green Bay, and I'll mention a little bit about that later. Uh, in 2021, we started an undergraduate program. Uh, we thought we might get, you know, a dozen students initially, but we already have over 50 students enrolled in a program. And I will say that our graduates uh, uh, to date, uh, I think the estimate was over 95% of them are getting jobs in the field and working in some aspect of water science. And these are our graduate program. So it's a, and, that, and the estimates are that the positions in this area are going to increase by 20% uh, over the next 10 years or so. Uh, we also host uh, the Great Lakes Genomic Center. And I mentioned that because a lot of the work done on understanding, for example, what the impact of of a contaminant or a stress on the ecosystem uh, or on organisms in the ecosystem is, is we now have the tools actually to figure that out. You know, it used to be they would take a, a beaker or something, put a few organisms in it and then squirt some contaminant in there and watch to see until half of them died. It was known as an LD50. Uh, and it really was no smoking gun. We really didn't know the biological mechanism, but now the genomics uh, and DNA sequencing, you can actually determine which genes are turned on or turned off, whether they got upregulated or downregulated. So it's really going to be the Rosetta Stone for understanding how organisms are stressed by different contaminants or other stresses in the ecosystem. At some point, I think we'll be able to go out, grab a fish or some other organism, bring it back to the lab and sequence and then look which genes are being turned on or off. And the organism itself will be a monitor in the system. And we're quite a ways away from that, but we now have the technology to do that. Again, this is a program, a center being run, uh, led by Rebecca and her colleagues. Uh, we also have a Center for Water Policy, you know, which is relatively new. It's led by Melissa Scanlon. Melissa, some of you may know, was the founder of Midwest Environmental Advocates, um, <clears throat> housed in, in Madison. Uh, this was supported by the RICO Fund, uh, along with uh, uh, support from Brookby and, and Sora Foundations. One of our key uh, policy fellows, of course, is Dan Egan, who, who you must know his parents are from around here. 
Uh, he published a book, of course, of Death and Life of the Great Lakes, in a, a New York Times bestseller. And he just came out uh, about a week ago or two weeks ago with a new book on phosphorus called The Devil's Element. And it's a great read, I'll tell you. When, you when, when it hits the bookstores, be sure and get a copy. He's just a phenomenal writer and a phenomenal storyteller. Um, and he gets it right, too. Uh, the other thing that we're involved in uh, is the development of a new research vessel. Our research vessel, the Niske, is 70 years old. Nothing lasts forever. Uh, and so we're in the process of building a new research vessel, actually being designed right here in Sturgeon Bay by Mark Pudlow of Seacraft Designs. Um, Mark uh, took over from Tim Grohl, whom some of you may know early on. <clears throat> and so we're in the process of raising $20 million for this vessel. And we're we're part way there. If anybody wants to make a contribution, don't leave here without talking to me. Uh, <clears throat> oops. Uh, let's see. I don't want to do that. Okay. There we go. What about the future? Uh, <clears throat> I'm involved with the International Joint Commission. That's the U.S. Canadian Treaty Organization, which oversees the boundary waters between the two countries. And we're in the process of, the IJC is in the process of developing a decadal science plan, research plan for the Great Lakes. This has never been done in the Great Lakes. So the marine science community, the oceanographers do this all the time, but it's never been done in the Great Lakes. And I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we'll begin to see an effort here to try and understand this system better. Because ultimately, what we want to do is predict what the future is going to bring. And the only way you can do that is, is if you understand, if you have a model, which how the system is going to function. And that model is only as good as your understanding of how the system functions so that you can build in all the processes and the dynamics into those models to allow you to forecast what the conditions will be in the future. But you also have to have the data to back it up. You need the data that allows you to verify those models, calibrate those models. You can then take those, that information of what's the system going to look like 5, 10, 20 years down the line and develop the policy and the management practices so that we can begin to restore and have protect a sustainable system. But the key is understanding how it works. And that's where the science comes in. But data is essential. Um, <clears throat> and a system is variable and there's as much noise going on in the Great Lakes as they are with the changes we have seen. Long-term data sets are absolutely essential. Data sets like the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewage District has been collecting. Because only after you collect data for you know, decades actually, that you can begin to decipher or tease out those long-term trends like climate change from the inherent sort of biological and other noise that's in the system. So it's, it's often difficult to, to support, but monitoring is, is a key element of, what, of understanding what's going on in the system um, because these models are complicated. Um, and trying to understand all the little arrows between the various boxes is that's how the system functions and that you have to understand those processes in order to, to build a model and have the data to calibrate and understand what's going on. But one of the, the programs uh, that is involved in collecting that data over long term is a Great Lakes Observing System. Um, GLOSS is part of uh, the Integrated Ocean Observing System, which is a national uh, system for monitoring the coastal ocean for security and water quality and a variety of other issues. Uh, and we operate uh, one of the gloss buoys here in Green Bay. It's NOAA buoy 45014, but you can get on that their website there, seagull.gloss.org, and, and get the data in real time. And it has wave information, has temperature, it has water quality data, it has meteorological data, it has a camera on board. You can see you know, what it looks like out there. If you're a, a fisherman, a recreational boater, the two things you want to know is, you know, is which way the wind blowing and how big are the waves. And so this buoy can, can give you that information. Uh, we also have buoys in, in Lake Michigan. And one of the key things for fishermen, of course, is the thermal regime, the thermal, uh, the changes in temperature is a function of depth. And they're the first guys we hear from when the temperature, when the temperature stream goes down. We immediately get call, hey, where's the temperature data? The other thing so it's on the horizon here for Green Bay is its designation as a, as a National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is a part of a NOAA network of research reserves 
uh, all over the country. There are two currently in the Great Lakes, one in Old Woman Creek and one in the St. Louis River estuary up in, in Duluth, Minnesota. And Green Bay is on track to be designated, I think, within two years. It's a long process. Um, if, if you want to know more about that, just check out UWGB's um, NER website. Um, and the person, as I mentioned, a graduate of our program who's leading that is, is, is Emily Tyner. So there's a lot of change in the offing um, <clears throat> with respect to climate, with respect to contaminants, with respect to changes in agriculture. There's a whole variety of things, even dead zones. But the one thing I think is also gonna happen is people are going to re recognize that this is a good place to live. I think the days of the Rust Belt are behind us. They are. Uh, and I think that people are gonna recognize that, hey, uh, the Great Lakes, I mean, if I live in California, I'm like, yeah, and there are already people who are moving here from, uh, and of course, the New York Times ran this article about Duluth, Minnesota. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, Duluth. I mean, I like Duluth, but I can think of a lot of places in the Great Lakes just as, as good as Duluth. But that it, it's all based on our climate, the fact that we have an inexhaustible supply of fresh water. Of course, it's a challenge to keep the water quality high, but we'll never run out of good fresh water. I mean, these lakes will be here 100 years, or 500 years, 1,000 years from now. You can't say that in California. You certainly don't say it in, in Lake Mead or the Colorado River. Um, <clears throat> we have a tremendous quality of life here. And of course, we have you know, a really um, well-educated workforce. And so there will be jobs here. So uh, my feeling is that the, you know, the trend is going to be for people to move in, in this area. And we'll see. I, I may not happen in my lifetime, but I think it's going to happen for sure. Uh, someone once said, we don't inherit the environment from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And I think that's so true. And that means it's up to us. You know, actually, we've incurred a debt, if you will, in the environment by contaminating when dealing with legacy pollution. Um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is, is, is making a good, a good effort in terms of cleaning up the system. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's behooving on us to do that so that we don't, you know, 30 years down the road, they are still dealing with these legacy problems. But we also need to get out in front of um, contamination problems and prevent, you know, them from occurring in the future. If we had known, for example, PCBs are going to cause a huge problem that they have caused in the Green Bay system, for example, where we spent, I don't know, $1.2, $1.3 billion to clean them up, if we had known in advance, not to use these compounds, <clears throat> we just saved ourselves a tremendous amount of money. And I think that's the point of the whole decadal science initiative. Well, let's, let's understand what's going on in this system because we really don't and what's going on. I just read an article in the New York Times uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, about the guy who uh, was actually um, invented leaded gasoline and also Freon which were godsends to the automobile industry and also to the refrigeration industry because of, you know, it, it gave a safe for refrigerant. The problem is both of those 50 years down the road created huge environmental problems, lead contamination, which was a major health issue. And of course, Freon, which is a chlorophore hydrocarbon was responsible for the hole in the ozone in Antarctica. Both of those, as you know, have now been contaminated, but it's a good example of not knowing exactly the impact of what you're doing. And that's what it's really important for us to do. And it makes economic sense. There's been estimates and these papers are a few years old now, but it's still true that, you know, for a $20 billion investment in restoration, we return conservatively anywhere from 50 to $70 billion in economic value to the system. So it makes sense. And also, you know, it seems like a lot of money. It's not a lot, it's not a lot of money. I mean, this, the Great Lakes region has the third largest economy in the world. It's a $6 trillion a year GDP, you know, so we can afford to do this. And as I said, you know, we, uh, it's just not something we inherit, it's something we borrow. We need to get out in front of that and repay that debt. So I've got a lot of collaborators, uh, of course, over the years in a number of different funding agencies that are just listed here. Um, and much of the work I've shown is not just me, but a lot of people, my students, et cetera. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you again to, to Mark for inviting me this evening and uh, for those of you showing up. Uh, if you're a, 
if you are a Facebook person, I guess it's being broadcasting, but, you know, do me a favor and check out the freshwater.uwm. Uh, I'm not a Facebook guy, but uh, you'll make my uh, my uh, staff really happy if you show up and, and click on like. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. But before I do that, I brought along a copy of uh, Dan Egan's book. Now, how many of you have actually read this book? Oh, most of you, that's good. Uh, and, and so somebody who hasn't read this book, um, uh, I thought I'd give it away. So I, I who hasn't read it here this evening? Okay, all right. All right, well, let's see. Uh, has anybody got, have you had a birthday in uh, this last month? Mine is Monday. Monday, okay, there you go. <laughs> there you go. It's an absolutely fantastic book, and I and I can also recommend Dan. So um, he'd be a great speaker at some point. I know Mark has tried to get hold of him. He's a tough guy to get now because he's promoting his new book. But, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great information. Some of it has you know, it's a little leery, but it uh, shows there's lots of work to do. So questions? Who has questions? I think it was in Dan Egan's book, he pointed out that the pharmaceuticals are uh, getting greater. The concentrations of fish that they've been testing, especially women's hormone medication, um, have they been able to figure out a way that they can filter that out at these sewage treatment facilities? <clears throat> you know, they're looking at it. I mean, these, concent these compounds are really small concentrations. The technology probably exists. Uh, but to my knowledge, there's no facility uh, that's, you know, attacking this problem and filtering them out because it, it's, 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 a, it's a really difficult problem to pull it out. And you almost have to, you know, just pull everything out because it's not like you can't just pick out metformin. Everything, is, you know, the, stuff that would pick out metformin would pick out a lot of other things. Well, it's going to be a challenge. The one thing I will say, you know, they do have... Um, you know, uh, pharmaceutical take back programs, you know, so it used to be when people were told, you know, throw it, you know, flush it down a toilet or something, don't do that. And if you do have to dispose of medicines and you can't, uh, the thing to do is to, is to package them, wrap them with duct tape and plastic and stuff and put them in the regular trash. Then they'll go into a landfill and, you know, presumably they'll be safe there for quite a long time. Um, but it's, it's a major challenge. I, I, you know, given this lecture before I had a, I had a doctor, you know, come up to me after he you know, so he said, "This drug saves people's lives." You know, he said, "This is a this is a very effective drug." And so I'm not saying, you know, we can't, but we have to figure out a way to deal with it uh, because otherwise it's going to come back to bite us in the future. But you're right; it's building up in the system. And one of the things you can make the calculation for metformin, and you can see it's probably 20 years worth of use to build it up this concentration that we're seeing in Lake Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Bob. Great uh, summation of our situation. Um, you, had a, you had a couple of slides where you had a uh, sort of transformation of science to policy to action. That gap between science and policy is torturous and frustrating, and often it doesn't work very well. So, um, any wisdom on that process? Yeah. Transforming science and policy. That's the principal reason why we formed the Center for Water Policy. Um, <clears throat> because taking the science and, and translating it into policy is not that easy. You know, closing that loop um, is difficult. We need to have really good information to, to give to policymakers. That you can, if they understand, uh, makes sense. That they understand is, you know, good science, um, and can be put into a credible predictions of what we need to be able to do. Um, but also to translate it into uh, language that they understand. Because a lot of scientists, I mean, don't, aren't necessarily great communicators of their science, and often they're dealing with very, you know, esoteric to the outside world information about you know what they're trying to study uh, and so having a having a center like a center for water policy which is i think one of the few in the great lakes is the only one 
Uh, is a key to that, but yeah, it's it's a problem getting yeah. legislators and others to listen is a problem. Yeah, it seems often anecdotal information seems to have more power than it does. A story is much more effective, you know, and it's true of a of a legislator or a policymaker when it hits home to them and their family or their constituents. When somebody calls them up and say, "Well, I'm concerned because I'm, I I don't feel too good." And I, I've been told I got PMOS in my well, you know. Okay, then then it becomes an issue. Yeah. So never be afraid to contact your your legislator and tell them, hey, this is a, this is a problem we're concerned about. Is that listen to you? Yes. Speaking of PFAS and PFAS chemicals, there have been some frightening reports in the news in the last couple of months about contamination in the Great Lakes. What, what could you comment on that? Yeah, so it's showing up everywhere, as you might guess. The problem with these compounds is they do not degrade at all. Um, and so we're beginning to, see, everywhere we look for it, we're finding it. So we're seeing it in Great Lakes fish as well. Now, again, it's, you know, it's in vanishing small concentrations, but it's there. Um, the same is true of micro, you know, these plastics, I mentioned 20 million pounds, that's a mind-boggling number getting into the Great Lakes annually. They don't just stay as water bottles. I mean, they, they break up into finer and finer particles and some of these really microplastics, so small, in fact, that they show up in the tissues of fish. And so if you're eating fish, sometimes you're actually eating plastic in part. And I don't want to exaggerate that problem, but we can't let this go unchecked. Yeah. Maybe time for one more if you got it. Otherwise, sure. Any anybody on Zoom have a question? You can unmute yourself and ask it. And just speak it out. If not, any other questions here? Okay. Thank you very actually, much. Well, I have one question. Oh, okay. I can't let you get away. <laughs> so if we read, uh, you know, the I know in Lake Michigan primarily because of the mussels, the productivity has gone down significantly which greatly uh, limits the fish it can produce, right? right? And that hasn't happened in Green Bay, but if we meet the lowered phosphorus target, yes, it is. It's a good question. That's a really good that, question. If you th how much do yeah. you think that's gonna affect yeah. fisheries? That's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm not smart enough to know, but I would say this, much of the productivity that you see in those green blooms of algae, there's an ecological dead end because nothing feeds on it. I mean, that stuff just goes to sink pretty quickly. It doesn't really enter the food chain. So we can back off the productivity of the algae in the system and still feed a very healthy fishery. So I'm reasonably optimistic. We'll see. It's an experiment anyway. But otherwise, I mean, we cannot tolerate, you know, the kind of, you know, poor water quality we have now. But I think Green Bay could ratchet back on the, on the on the algal blooms and still have a healthy walleye fishery. Well, that's great guidance for fishermen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's give them one another one.